The Finder is the first of the five stories found in Ursula K. Le Guin's fifth Earthsea book, Tales from Earthsea, and it tells us the backstory of Roke and of magic and of Earthsea itself, its political disintegration into not quite anarchy, but a time, a very dark time of slavery and warlords and battles being between wizards and people turning against the magic users who are actually doing good, like the village sorcerers and witches. And central to the turning point of the story is going to be what happens on the Isle of Roke, long familiar to all of us Earthsea readers from the first four novels. This is the backstory about how Roke came to be Roke. And what we find is originally it's a, a very different kind of place. And it, it, all of this happens largely through the eyes of Medra or Otter. Later on, he'll be called Turn and he goes by other names as well in different places. And we get gradually introduced to Roke in part by seeing the reflections of what we could call the, the actions and plans uh, early on of Roke uh, manifested in the hand. And before that, we get to see that Otter runs into things that are kind of like the hand, but not quite the same. Otter is a boy on Havnor who was born with some magical ability. And um, Otter is taught more than just the song of, of creation by this, this wise woman, a uh, crafty person, right? And uh, she knew his gift. She, she and some men and women like her, people of no fame, some of questionable reputation, had in all some degree that gift. And they shared in secret what lore and craft they had. Now, why? And this is, this is something that's going to get us to the, the grand idea of the pattern or the equilibrium in a bit. A gift untaught is a ship unguided, they said to Otter, and they taught him all they knew. It wasn't much, but there were some beginnings of the great arts in it, and though he felt uneasy at deceiving his parents, he couldn't resist this knowledge and the kindness and praise of his poor teachers. It will do you no harm if you never use it for harm, they told him, and that was easy for him to promise uh, them. And then uh, later he runs into a, a man who is the changer and he teaches Otter some illusion and then he teaches him the great spell of changing and he's told that if he learns the changer's great spell he would never use it but to save a life his own or another's. And so Otter is, is being introduced not just to the art of magic but also to the need to keep it secret and also to the fact that it's not just supposed to be used for any ends whatsoever, like the great wizards do, uh, gain, rivalry, those sorts of things. And even when he's taken prisoner by uh, Lawson and his men who are going to use him, the hound says, we crafty people need to stick together. So even the hound who's caught up in this can recognize that there's, there's some need to have solidarity, you could say. Later on, he's going to encounter the, you could call it, the first fingers of the hand that he can run into. So this is after he escapes from uh, the wizard Gellick and takes Aniab as far as she can go before she dies and then comes to her, her village. And they tell him, there's people all over these parts and maybe beyond who think, as you said, that nobody can be wise alone. So these people try to hold to each other. And that's why we're called the hand or the women of the hand, though we're not women only. But it serves to call ourselves women for the great folk don't look for women to work together or to have thoughts about such things as rule or misrule or have any powers. Calling themselves women in a world that is male-dominated allows them to disguise themselves. And then they bring up the idea about Morid's Isle a place where the women of the hand have kept the old arts and they teach them not keeping them a secret each to himself as the wizards do. And Mead says, maybe with such teaching you could teach the wizards a lesson. And Io says, maybe you can find that island. 
Otter looked from one to the other. Clearly, they had told him their own greatest secret and their hope. Morad's Isle, he said. That would be only what the women of the hand call it, keeping its meaning from the wizards and the pirates. To them, it would no doubt bear some other name. And so over the next several years, that is what Otter Medra is looking for, calling himself by many names as he sails the islands of Earthsea, actually getting to study with a mage who he becomes apprentice to, Hydrake in Pendor, and takes over as a, a mage uh, for a, a short amount of time, and then goes sailing again, looking for this isle. And he will find it because of shipwreck. They get close to Roke, and the ship is turned on its side. He changes himself into a, a seabird, flies off, and when he lands on the island, he's transformed back into his own human form. So this is really quite something, right? There's, there's a great description here. To it he flew and on it he landed it, and as he touched the earth he was a man again. He stood there for a while bewildered. It seemed to him it was not by his own act or decision he had taken his own form, but that in touching this ground, this hill, he had become himself. A magic greater than his own prevailed here. He looked around, cautious and wary. All across the hill sparkweed was in flower, its long petals blazing yellow in the, gla in the grass. Children of Havnor knew that flower. And he goes down. Um, then he saw the people. They stood among the tall grasses, among the uh, flame-shaped flowers nodding in the wind of morning. Then they were all gone. And he stood alone on the hill, shaken and wondering. I have seen the kings and queens of Earthsea, and they are only the grass that grows on this hill. So he knows this is a special place. He walks into town, starts chatting to people, and now they want to know, who is this guy and what's he doing? And they ask him, how did you actually come here? And he says, I was born in Havnor, trained as a shipwright and sorcerer. I was on a ship bound from Geeth to Oport. I was spared alone from drowning last night when a witch wind struck. And then they say, how did you come here? As a bird, a tern. Is this Roke Island? You changed yourself. He nodded. Whom do you serve? This is a key question for them. Uh, she had a keen, hard face with long black brows. I have no master. What was your errand in Oport? In Havnor, years ago, I was in servitude. Those who freed me told me about a place where there are no masters, and the rule of Seriad is remembered and the arts are honored. I have been looking for that place, that island, seven years. Who told you about it? The women of the hand. Anyone can make a fist and show a palm, said the tall woman pleasantly, but not everybody can fly to roke or swim or sail or come in any way, so we must ask what brought you here. And here we, we find out more about Medra's own mindset. Chance, favoring long desire, not art, not knowledge. I think I've come to the place I saw it, but I don't know. I think you may be the people they told me of, but I don't know. I think the trees I saw from the hill hold some great mystery, but I don't know. I only know that since I've set foot on the hill, I've been as I was when I was a child and first heard the deed of Enlad sung. I am lost among wonders. Then they, they ask him again, if you stayed here, what would you do? I can build boats or mend them and sail them. I can find above and underground. I can work weather if you have any need from that. And I'll learn the art from any who will teach me. What do you want to learn, they ask. And now here you would imagine he would say, well, this kind of magic and this kind of magic and this kind of magic that I heard of, that would be really great. What does he say instead? A moral and metaphysical question, something very, very deep. Medra felt he had been asked the question on which the rest of his life hung for good or evil. He started to speak and didn't speak and finally spoke. I could not save one, not one, not the one who saved me. Nothing I know could have set her free. He's talking about Anieb who saved him. I know nothing. If you know how to be free, I beg you, teach me. So this is what he's looking for. Not just freedom to enjoy but to understand what freedom is. And this leads to a long discourse that's going to tell us about why Roke is the way it is. They are all 
prisoners on the isle where they are safe and free, at least for the time being. And now we come to the story of the invasion. Um, Thirty years before, the pirate lords of Wathort had sent a fleet to conquer Roke, not for its wealth, which was little, but to break the power of its madgery, which was reputed to be great. Now, why? Because the hand and its madgery are promoting freedom from slavery, from domination, from fear, from exploitation in other places. One of the wizards of Roke had betrayed the island to the crafty men of Wathort, their own wizards, right? Lowering its spells of defense and warning. Once those were breached, the pirates took the island not by wizardries, but force and fire. Their great ships filled Twill Bay. Their hordes burned and looted. Their slave takers carried off men, boys, young women. Little children in the old they slaughtered. They fired every house and field they came to. When they sailed away after a few days, they left no village standing, the farmstead in ruins or desolate. So most of the islanders who had survived were wise women and their children who had hidden themselves in the town or in the imminent grove, which we'll come to soon. The men now on Roke were those spared children, grown, and a few men now grown old, There was no government left but the women of the hand, for it was their spells that had protected Roke so long and protected it far more closely now. They had little trust in men. A man had betrayed them. Men had attacked them. It was men's ambitions, they said, that had perverted all the arts to ends of gain. We do not deal with their governments, said Tall Vale in her mild voice. So this is... Where they are now, they are a matriarchal society run by the women who have magical power, distrustful of the ways of men, rightly so, since uh, you know the raiding and looking at the rest of Earthsea outside. We also learned that men and women of the hand had joined together on Roke a hundred or more years ago, forming a league of mages. Proud and secure in their powers, they'd sought to teach others to band together in secret against the war makers and slave takers until they could rise openly against them. Women had always been leaders in the league, said Ember, and women in the guise of salve sellers and net makers and such had gone from Roke to other lands among the inmost sea, weaving a fine, wide net of resistance. And that is what the network of the hand was and still to some degree is. So it's not just magical power that Roke represents. It's a way of understanding the world and human beings and morality, a a way that's in some respects realistic and optimistic about the prospects. Many people, when they are placed in conditions where they see that the good don't prosper and the evil do in fact you know, hold power, they get cynical and say, well, there's, there's nothing we can do. Roke was a place that was using magical power to undo that, to prepare a way for a better Earthsea, and they are attacked for that. The rest of the hand winds up being cut off by Roke's choice of isolation, a choice that is an easy choice to make given the horrors and trauma inflicted upon them. So the rest of the hand is, you know, the fingers, the connective tissues are all allowed to sort of go their own way. And that, you know, can can be kind of a problem, right? Even now there were strands and knots of that, le- that net left. Medra had come on one of those traces first in Aniab's village and followed them since, but they had not led, them, not led him here. Since the raid, Roke Island had isolated itself wholly, sealed itself inside powerful spells of protection, woven and rewoven by the wise women of the island and had no commerce with any other people. We can't save them, Ember said. We couldn't save ourselves. Is, are they drawing the wrong lesson from the fact that they couldn't save themselves at that time? What are they doing there? They are sharing with each other. As um, Le Guin remarks, what they had, they shared, in that it was indeed Morid's Isle. Nobody on Roke starved or went unhoused, though nobody had much more than they needed. 
hidden from the rest of the world, not only by sea and storm, but their defenses. They worked and talked and sang the songs, the winter carol and the deed of the young king. And they had books, the Chronicles of Enlod and the history of the wise heroes. From these precious books, the old men and women would read aloud in a hall down by the wharf where the fisherwomen made and mended their nets. There was a hearth there and they would light the fire. People came even from farms across the island to hear the histories read, listening in silence, intent. Our souls are hungry, Ember said. There is a desire for knowledge, a desire for meaning, a desire for hearing about a time that's not all pillage and butchery and blind ambition and damage done without attention to the pattern governing the world. They spend their time teaching and learning, rebuilding. There's also a, a beautiful side story here about Ember and, uh, you know, Taryn now, Otter Taryn Medra, falling in love in the Imminent Grove. He goes and, you know, the Imminent Grove are trees whose roots go down to the very bottom of Earthsea. Um, he, he asks Ember to tell him what the Imminent Grove was for when he'd asked others. They said, Ember can tell you. She refused his question, not arrogantly, but definitely saying, you can learn about the grove only in and from it. And he goes along. She says, I'll be going to the grove after the long dance. Come if you like. There's some great descriptions of it. It seemed that from Roque Knoll, the whole extent of the grove could be seen. Yet if you walked in it, you did not always come out in the fields again. You walked on under the trees. In the inner grove, they were all of one kind, which grew nowhere else, yet had no name in Hardick but tree. In the old speech, Ember said, each of these trees had its own name, implying that they are all like persons. You walked on, and after a while, you were walking again among familiar trees. People in Thwill told him it was best not to go on too far, since only by returning as you went could you be sure about coming out into the fields. How far does the forest go? Medra asked, and Ember said, as the mind goes. The leaves of the trees spoke, she said, and the shadows could be read. I am learning to read them. And so he camps nearby. He doesn't know what Ember wanted. Of him, He hoped she meant to teach him to answer his questions about the grove, but she said nothing, and he was shy and cautious, fearing to intrude upon her solitude. The second day he was there, he told her to come with her and led, her very far, led him very far into the wood. They walked for hours in silence. In the summer midday, the woods were silent. No birds sang. The leaves did not stir. The aisles of the trees were endlessly different and all the same. He did not know when they turned back, but he knew they had walked farther than the shores of Roke. And they spend time together over and over with that. And eventually they fall in love. Um, they become a couple. And he says, uh, they're, they're eating peaches. If I told you my name, my true name, I, I'd tell you mine, she said. If that's how we should begin. They began, however, with the peaches. They were both shy. When Medra took her, his hand shook, and Ember, whose name was Ella Hall, turned away scowling. Then she touched his hand very lightly. And it goes on from there. They become intimate. They become a couple. And they will become great supports to each other. Um, their, their friendship develops. The question that they will engage with, that they will... Uh, not just have like a debate about, but actually work out with each other is what should happen now. And this is a key issue. Um, he tells the story of the minds of Samri, the Willard Gellock, and Aniab the slave to Vale and Ember. When he was done, Vale was silent a long time and then said, that's what you meant when you first came here. I could not save the one who saved me. And you asked me, what could you tell that would make me trust you? Um, here we go. She gave me freedom, he said, and I still feel that all I do is done through her and for her. Not, not for her. We can do nothing for the dead, but... Ember says, for us, who, for us who live in hiding, neither killed nor killing, the dead are dead, the great and mighty go their way unchecked. All the hope that left in the world is of the people of no account. And then the question comes up, must we hide forever 
Is this the course that we have to pursue? And Ember says, spoken like a man. <laughs> right? And there is a good reason why they should hide. She says, yes, we must hide and forever if need be. There's nothing left but being killed and killing beyond these shores. Medra says, but you can't hide true power. Not for long, it dies in hiding unshared. And Vale says, magic won't die on Roke. On Roke, all spells are strong. You've walked under the trees. Our job must be to keep that strength. Hide it. Yes, hoard it as a young dragon hoards up his fire and share it, but only here, pass it on one to the next where it's safe and where the great robbers and killers would least look for it since no one here is of any account. And one day the dragon will come into its strength if it takes a thousand years. And then here's the, the central problem. But outside Roke, Medra said, there are common people who slave and starve and die in misery. Must they do so for a thousand years with no hope? And here's where we have the question of, of the pattern, uh, the, the equilibrium, as, as they come to call it, right? Should they remain hidden at the center of magic where the pattern will hold, the pattern is strong, but everywhere outside is chaos and exploitation and domination and destruction and fear. And um, here's what Ember says. The true art prevails over the false. The pattern will hold. That I know, but our lives are short and the pattern's very long. If only Roke was what it what, if, if only Roke was now what it once was, if we had more people of the true art gathering here, teaching and learning as well as preserving, and uh, Medra says, the solution lies in secrecy, but so does the problem. And then, coming out of, out of uh, not Medra, but Ember, comes another suggestion. A school where the wise might come to learn from one another to study the pattern, the grove would shelter us. And then... They talked into long winter and others talked with them. Slowly their talk turned from vision to intention, from longing to planning. Vale was always cautious, warning of dangers. White-haired Dune was so eager. Ember said he wanted to start teaching sorcery to every child in Twill. Once Ember had come to believe that Roke's freedom lay in offering others freedom. That's a very key thing there. Then she set her whole mind on how the women of the hand might grow strong again. And they realize that they need to formulate their art. They need to figure out what their art actually is. Now, that's a key insight, though, that we should go back to. Their freedom is not something that can be hoarded up, isolated from the rest of the world. Their freedom is in teaching others freedom, which will be a dangerous thing to do. It will place them at risk. It will not always succeed. It will often fail. But it's still something that holds out a greater prospect and can extend this pattern and restore it within Earthsea. And that is indeed what Roke, in its, its you know, full sense, is refounded to do.